when you uh, when you begin to put on your shirt, let's say you got on a long sleeve shirt, you're going to put on a long sleeve shirt. When you put on your shirt, which arm do you put it on first, right or left? Right? Who puts it on right? Who puts left arm in your shirt first? You do that every time? You're weird. <laughs> I, tried putting, I tried putting my shirt on this morning. I always put my right arm in first. And this morning, for some reason, I thought, I'm going to do it in my left arm. I don't know why. I think I had a suspender for my, my uh, suit trousers. I had the suspenders already over in my T-shirt, and I was about to put my dress shirt on. And I had this suspender up first, so I thought, I'll just do it left-handed. So I tried to put my left and I couldn't hit the hole in the arm and I couldn't get it to go it's hanging up and I'm struggling you know like I'm wrestling with something now boy it's a lot easier to just do this right-handed you know but you know we we tend to be creatures of habit and we do same things the same way um, which which side of the sandwich do you start eating on do you start at the top in the middle or do you start on the corner how many start at the top right smack dab in the middle how many of you start on the corner, one side? Yeah, see. How many of you start on the bottom? Okay, so we're not all weird. <laughs> Men, when you shave, you start, on, start shaving on the right side, putting your lather on this side, or your electric razor, do you start shaving on the right side or the left? How many start on the right side? How many start on the left? Well, see, it's kind of divided up there. Ladies, which side do you start shaving your face on? Well, I heard somebody say, never compliment a lady's mustache, no matter how awesome it is. <laughs> It'll get you in trouble every time. <laughs> now, this, this is one that's been going on for a long time. Everybody's interested in this one. Do you like for the toilet paper roll hanging with the loose side down from the back against the wall or on the front hanging out at the front? How many like it on the front? How many like it on the back? God, shame, shame them. <laughs> I like, I like the, the loose end uh, hanging out front. You know, it's easier to get a hold of that way. Now, my wife and I can't agree on that, so we have two bathrooms in the house. I just adopted the other bathroom for my bathroom. I put toilet paper on there the way I want, you know. <laughs> and so we make choices like that. But about eating your sandwich or shaving or putting your arm in the shirt or which way you hang the toilet paper roll, do you think any of that will really matter much in eternity? No. no. It really won't make much difference, I don't think. Um, but I want to mention something that will make a difference for eternity. What do you believe an altar is? And what place does it have in your life? An altar. Modern day living is full of demands. I mean, you've got voices coming from you off the internet, off the TV, uh, your friends, your peers, your bosses at church. You've got, you got voices coming at you from every direction. We've got customs and traditions and peer pressure and, and everything's just coming at us. Information. We've got information overload today. Man, we've got a lot of information, but not much, not much wisdom. It seems like we can become imprisoned by the things around us instead of that which is most important in life. Even our worship can become so self-centered that we forget that God is supposed to be first in it. I think there's some churches that have very loud and exuberant music program but I don't know if God's within 100 miles of that place. I know there's preaching that goes on. And it may be fantastic, exuberant, exhilarating, encouraging. But I don't know if God's in it. So many lives today are lived out in desperation. One poet said, all men leave lives of quiet desperation and it seems like inside there's a struggle going on we're trying to figure out do I do this because I feel like it or do I do that because it seems like the right thing to do and we've all got a 
conversation going on inside and, and we're looking for something to satisfy and to please and bring joy and peace in our life. I want to read to you, and you can read along with me if you'd like, in Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter number 12. And beginning in verse number 1, we're going to look at the life of Abraham in brief, and then we'll look at some other things through the Scripture. But I want to use this as for a starting place. Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that cur- bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance and that they had gathered in the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. Now, Canaan is a picture of the blessed life. Canaan is not really a picture of heaven. Sometimes we sing songs that... And it's nice to think about, you know, living in Canaan land, but it's not really heaven. In the Bible, the picture of Canaan is the surrendered, blessed, Christ-filled life. And so here we see in the last part of verse number 5, it says, And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land under the place of Sichem in the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he, what? An altar. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who had appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east side of Bethel and pitched his tent having (coughs) on the west and and Hai on the east and There he builded an altar. Wherever Abram went, it seems like he's building an altar. Why is he doing that? He built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we love you this morning. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for enriching our lives and especially, Lord, enriching our lives with the word of God. If it were not for the word of God, dear Lord, we'd be left to wander and listen to voices from every direction. And our lives would be a confused mess more than it is already. But we have your word and therefore we know it's your voice. We pray that you'd bless us this morning. Help us to learn about altars. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God comes to Abraham when he's in a pagan land, Ur of the Chaldees. God comes to him and says, now, Abraham, I want to take you out of this country. I'm going to take you to a place, and I'll show you where it is. You just load up, load your family up, load up your goods, and and you go, and I'll tell you as you go where you're going. And you'll know when you get there, I'll let you know. And he said, by the way, Abraham, I I want to bless you. I want to bless you in a big way. I want to give you things that you never dreamed were possible. I want you to have a life of blessing where you're you're letting those blessings flow through you like a channel and it'll be blessings to everybody around you. I want to use you, Abraham, to be a blessing. Abraham communicated with God and Abraham began to build altars so that he could sacrifice his own will for the Lord's will. What place does the idea of an altar have in our lives? What place does an altar have? Well, let's ask some questions about it and see if we can find some Bible answers. Let's ask the question first. What is an altar anyway? What is an altar? Well, 
Abraham and, and the patriarchs would build an altar many times out of stone. It'd be a, maybe a, an erected uh, high place and they'd put stones together and build them up to an elevated position. And there they would make sacrifice and commune with the Lord. Well, what is an altar? An altar is not necessarily, you know, in, in modern times we call maybe this platform the altar. And when we give a, an invitation at the end of a message, a lot of times people will come forward and they'll kneel at, at what we call the altar. But, a, but an altar is not just a place made out of boards and maybe it's got carpet on it. It is a place and it can be used as an altar. But an altar more than just wood, and brick or mortar or stone, carpet. What is an altar? I want to submit to you, first of all, it's a place of surrender. It's, it's not important if this has, if this altar, it doesn't matter if it has carpet on it, if it's made out of hardwood, or if it had an old pine bench out front like the old time mourner's bench. Those things are not as important. Kind of like which arm do you put in your shirt sleeve first? Or which side of your face do you shave first? The altar is not, what it's made of is not very important. Our modern altar may look different in every church you go in. What the altar ought to be, according to the Bible, and everything that we see in the altars is a place of surrender. A place where the heart says yes to God's will. A place of surrender where the soul says, God, what wilt thou have me to do? You tell me, Lord, I'll sign, a, I'll sign the check. And you fill in the amount. It's a place of surrender. Abraham came to such a place. Abraham had been told he's going to be a blessing. Abraham's been told that he's going to have a baby boy one day. Abraham's getting old. And so he begins to think maybe he's not going to have it. And maybe God's promise wasn't going to come true. But eventually it did. You know, something about God, he always keeps his promise. It may not happen in our time. It may not happen as we expected. But God keeps his promises. Amen. And this old man <coughs> of 100 years old, his wife Sarah had a baby. <coughs> Just like God promised. And then as that little baby began to grow up, oh, he must have been... Oh, this, this boy must have been the apple of Abraham's eye. I mean, there's something about, and, and only those who have children normally would be able to experience the feelings that comes along with being a parent and having a child of your own, whether adopted or whether by biological birth. When you have a child, there's something about your child that's just different. I mean, you may love children, but if you've got one of your own, there's a special love there. Is that not true? And Abraham had been waiting now for a hundred years and now he's a father. By miracle of God, he has a boy. And now the boy begins to grow. And as he watched the little boy grow up, he must have looked at that little boy. You know how little boys are. Hey, daddy, come and look at this. Watch what I can do. And, uh, and so Abraham must have loved that little boy very dearly. This was a special treasure that nothing else could compare with. This baby boy that belonged to Abraham. But then the day came when God said to Abraham, you take that boy and you travel a long distance till you come to Mount Moriah and on that mount I want you to sacrifice that boy. Can you imagine the emotions that must have flooded Abraham's heart? His soul must have been melted within him. How can I do this? How can I say yes to God and surrender my child? Can somebody do that? Maybe I should just say no to God. Do you think that thought maybe ever came through Abraham's mind? Maybe I just said, now Lord, I know, you, I know you've been good to me and you've promised me blessings and you've given me riches and you've given me a lot of things. Lord, I'm, I've got a lot of cattle and a lot of land and, and man, everything's come true just like you said, but Lord, I can't sacrifice my boy. He's forgetting who gave him that boy, if he thinks that. But there's no hint in Scripture that Abraham ever wavered from obeying God. 
He took the boy and he went the three days journey to Mount Moriah, probably weeping and shaking inside, trembling. Every fiber of his body and in his mind must have been shaken because he's going to have to sacrifice the boy he loves so much. But he goes saying yes to God. He goes to Mount Moriah. He has the servants to wait with the donkeys down the bottom of the mountain and he goes up with, with his son Isaac. He puts Isaac on an altar. Altar. A place of sacrifice. You talk about sacrifice, this is a big one. My heart just hurts thinking about it. My heart goes out to Abraham as this dilemma seems to choke his soul. In Genesis 22.10, Abraham finds this altar. It says in verse number 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Oh, can you imagine the relief that must have come into the heart of Abraham as the angel says, don't do it. God has said, I'm satisfied. I see that you fear me. Now, don't, don't harm the boy. And he saw a ram caught by his horns in a thicket and he takes the, the ram and sacrifices him at the instruction of God instead. God never had intended to let Abraham slay that boy. He wanted to see that God would, that Abraham would follow through and sacrifice on the altar. You know what God wants? He wants to see if we'll sacrifice something that's valuable. I heard, about, I heard about the people that sent, this is a true story, a missionary told me this, a missionary in the Caribbean said he was ministering to very, very poor people in, in the Caribbean, and some native tribes, and, and uh, everybody knew in the States, everybody knew that he was ministering to those poor people there. And, and so this one church took up an offering of used tea bags and sent them to the missionary. Used tea tea bags I said are you kidding me he said no I'm serious he said that's exactly what they did is that really sacrifice I think God wants to see us sacrifice something of value David David, when he was called on to sacrifice to the Lord uh, at a certain place and he wanted a piece of land to make his sacrifice on and, and this Landowner was willing to give King David the land. And David said, no, sir. I'm not going to sacrifice something of no value, something that was free to the Lord. I'll pay you for this and I'll make a sacrifice of value. Some people are looking for an easy way out. God expects us to sacrifice, to surrender Abraham found himself at an altar that he had visited many times before when he was communing with the Lord, but he didn't realize it would turn into such a sacrifice. But oh, was it a blessing. In the New Testament, we have, we have an altar. In uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your, your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God wants us to sacrifice something in the New Testament, not your son, not your daughter. God doesn't want you to kill anybody. God doesn't even want you to commit suicide. What God wants is you a living sacrifice. He's not looking for a dead sacrifice, but he wants you to live for him. He doesn't want you to die for him. Jesus died for you. And he's looking for a, a living sacrifice. You, you say, well, that's easy. I'd be, able, I'd be able and willing to give myself as a sacrifice. Or would you? Well, <laughs> what would that involve? Your life 
can be more productive and joyful if you do sacrifice. Missionaries have had to do it. Ministers have had to do it. And Christians who are blessed and have got peace in their heart had to sacrifice. But what did they sacrifice? Sometimes you've got to sacrifice your will. Sometimes you have to sacrifice some friends. I'm not saying turn your back on them. I'm just saying that if you choose to live a holy and godly life, there will be some friends who will desert you. You have to be willing to give them up. You know, there's some friends you ought not to have. Teenagers, there's some friends you ought not to have. If a friend tries to lead you away from God, if a, if a friend tries to mock God and a friend begins to tell you that not all of this is true and a friend tries to get you to turn against your parents and against what they've taught you and against your church and, and against the Lord and tries to get you to go the sinful way, you better sacrifice those friends. Yeah. What is the altar? It's a place of surrender. Say, Lord, it, it's all for you. It's a place of sacrifice. Abel learned that when he sacrificed an acceptable offering to the Lord in Genesis. It's a place of sure death. In Leviticus, we learn about the sacrificial lamb. And when that lamb was taken to the altar, that lamb was slain and its blood was shed. The lamb died. Sure death. I mean, the offerer didn't take his lamb up there to the temple and tie it up to the post on Sunday morning and say, okay, well, I'm, I'm here for the day and I'll take my lamb home on Sunday night and then I'll live like I want to Monday through Saturday. <laughs> no, that lamb was a permanent sacrifice and his death. You know what you and I in the New Testament era do? I'm glad we don't have to sacrifice little lambs. <laughs> Aren't you? I mean, I'm glad we live in the New Testament church age. I wouldn't want to have to sacrifice a lamb. But there has to be a death involved in the sacrifice. Paul said, I die daily. Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. John 12, 24. Die to self. You know what? If, if Americans all across the nation today, if Americans died to self, there wouldn't be near as many people offended at every little thing that happens. <laughs> Even Christians, if Christians just died to self, you know what that means? That means that I die to my self-desires and I live to God to fulfill His desires. We would get to where we wouldn't, we wouldn't be offended at every little thing that came along. We'd be thankful for what we've got instead of what we ain't got. Die to self. Lee Robertson, the pastor who pastored uh, uh, the large church in uh, Chattanooga for 40 years, thousands of people came to hear Lee Robertson preach. And I don't know why, he only preached 20 minute messages. I think you got to preach an hour and a half to really do your job. No, I'm just, just kidding. He built a great church, big church. And he looked down one Sunday morning and he saw an altercation going on right here on the right side near a stairway that went up to the balcony. He saw something going on and there was some, he could tell there were ill feelings and hurt feelings and anger and uh, he recognized one of the ladies that was involved in it. The others were visitors but he recognized the old, older lady and, and after service was over he went down and, and asked her what had happened. She said, well, those people came and sat in my pew. I've been sitting there for over 20 years. And they got in my pew. And I told them they were sitting in the wrong place. She said, I made them move. He said, I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You need to die to self. And you wouldn't be so offended about something so minor as that. Die to self. Died to self, and, and if kids died to self, they wouldn't be so upset when their parents correct them and discipline them and send them in the right direction. And husbands wouldn't be so offended if their wives, if they didn't get exactly everything they wanted, and wives wouldn't be offended at their husbands if they didn't get exactly everything they wanted, if they died to self. And say, so, you know, I believe in J-O-Y acronym, 
J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, and you third. My microphone turned off. <laughs> you third. You know, we live in a me first generation. You know that. Everybody wants to be first. I'm looking out for the great me. <laughs> it ought not to be that way. Not for a Christian. It ought to be Jesus first, others second, and you last. See, I don't like the way it sounds. That's true. I'm going to preach it anyway. <laughs> We have an altar. Where is the altar? Well, it can be the front of the church for sure. It could be in your prayer closet at home. Your altar could be on a stump out in the woods where you've been cutting trees. It's a place primarily, it's a place, listen, it's a place primarily where the heart is surrendering itself to God and saying yes to the Lord and no to self, wherever that altar happens to be. So question number two, what do we need to place on the altar. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies unto God a living sacrifice. Present your body first. Present your body. All things were created by him and for him. This body is not my own. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, you are bought with a price. 2 Corinthians, you're bought with a price precious blood of Jesus. I don't have the right to dress my body the way I want to dress it. I have, the, I have the obligation to dress my body the way he wants me to dress it. As Brother Vineyard, my pastor when I was in Bible college, used to say, well, the, the burlesque season is coming up, so it's time to preach on modesty. <laughs> you know, there was a, he, he was preaching about women stripping down and men too, stripping down half naked in those days when hot weather came and exposing their body well, he'd really be shocked today. I mean, there was a time when, when women wouldn't come and answer the door in their underwear. Now they go to the beach with it on. <laughs> huh? The way we present our bodies, a living sacrifice to God. I mean, I'm telling you, there's a lot of, a lot of women wearing uh, skimpy enough clothing. I mean, there's not enough material in some of those things that you can make a good pair of leggings for a mosquito. What do we sacrifice? Sacrifice our body. Love the Lord with all your body, all your mind, all your spirit, with everything you are. Worship the Lord. We need to sacrifice our homes. As Joshua said, we need to say, as Joshua, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There needs to be some men to take charge in the, in the family and, and bring it to a point where where the wife's not having to be the spiritual leader in the home. Many times she has to because of default. Because <laughs> he won't. Men ought to take charge and say, we're going to go to church Sunday and I'm going to not just send you to church, I'm going to take you to church. I'm going with you. A spiritual man will be the spiritual priest of his family. We need to make sure our kids are exposed to the teachings of the word of God at home, Take them to church, what they're taught. That's our obligation. We need to sacrifice our homes on the altar and say, you know, we're not here just to watch bad television movies. We're here to serve the Lord. We ought to sacrifice our pocketbooks. Our pocketbooks. <laughs> one, one preacher said of a, a man he'd led to the Lord and baptized him, uh, somebody asked him about him uh, later on. He said, is he still coming to church? He said, no, he got mad because he preached on offerings and giving to the Lord one time. And he got mad and quit. I guess when I baptized him, I must not have got his billfold wet. <laughs> what happens? Let's bring it down to the final conclusion. What happens when we place all on the altar? We're talking about surrendering all. I surrender all. What happens when we do that? Well, the fire comes down from heaven. You remember the story of Elijah when he went up to meet the, the, uh, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? I've been there, went there one time. They got a statue of Elijah up at the place where he slew the prophets of Baal. I don't remember if there was any heads laying around on the ground in front of his statue or not, but, but uh, it was an interesting place to be. 
And when Elijah went up on Mount Carmel, he built an altar and he let the prophets of Baal, he let them cry and weep and wail on that altar and they couldn't call rain down from heaven or fire down from heaven or nothing else. When old Elijah, the man of God, that old burly, mean and nasty prophet, <laughs> when he got up, he prayed a, a simple prayer with 60 some odd words in it, asking God to let the rain come and, and boy, the fire from heaven fell on that altar. It licked up all the water out of the ditches they had poured full of water around it, licked up the fire, licked up the wood, the stones, water and everything. The fire of God fell from heaven. That's what happens when the altar is important in your life. You get the fire of God back in your life. You remember when you first got saved and how important it was for you to go to church? Remember when you first got saved and, and uh, Bible reading time and prayer time is something you look forward to? Remember when you first got saved and you want to tell everybody else about the fact that you got saved? Remember when you first got saved and you were ready to tell others how to get saved? And you remember when you were all fired up and they'd have, a, they'd have a revival meeting and man, you wanted to be there every night of the week. You didn't want to miss nothing. You didn't even want to miss a Wednesday night service. You didn't want to miss Sunday school. You wanted to lick it all in. The fire of God comes back in your life when the altar has its proper place. You know what else happens? The song of the Lord begins. At the temple in the Old Testament, boy, they had forgotten about the altar and the altar had gone unattended and the house of God had lost its song. And here's what it says in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 27. And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also. <laughs> with the trumpets and with the instruments, ordained by David, king of Israel. For 16 years, the song of the Lord had been gone out of their house, out of the house of the Lord. And then when they make the sacrifice and reinstitute that altar in their daily life, boy, the song of the Lord started again. You know, when you go to church and, and the Lord gets a hold of your heart and you want to sing, and the song leader doesn't have to try to coax you to sing. That's the way it was on this day. There in Old Testament Israel, boy, the song of the Lord came back in the house of the Lord. That's what happens when the altar has its place. Backslider, there might have been a time when you were excited about things of the Lord and lost your song. In Psalm 137, verses 1 through 4, the children of Israel have been carried away captive into Babylon because of their sin. They were backsliders. They got carried away captive it says in verse number one, by the rivers of Babylon we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And they said, how, how shall we sing the Lord's song? in a strange land. Backslider, when you've been carried back away from the Lord and prayer is not important anymore and Bible reading is not important anymore and, and church is just something you can take or leave and grudges have filled your heart and turned you bitter and maybe you're mad at the preacher, maybe you're mad at the song leader, maybe you're mad at somebody in church and you've let that root of bitterness spring up and you're just, you're out. Things are not the same. You can't sing that song. You can't sing the Lord's song. It'll come back when you get on the altar, though, when you sacrifice and say, Lord, have thine own way. The power of God will be restored in our lives. It says in Acts 4.31, and, and when they prayed, the place where they prayed was shaken. The power of God came back to them. After Jacob wrestled with the Lord at the book Jabbok on his way back to the promised land. He wrestled with the Lord. Jacob had been a, a sorry, no good rascal, way away from the Lord, doing everything wrong that could be done wrong. But God still loved him. God wrestled with him at that brook when they were all alone. You know how it is when you get alone with the Lord? At the altar is a good place to get alone with the Lord and the Lord will wrestle with you. He's not done with you. 
and he'll ask you to come back and he'll wrestle with you and drag you back. <laughs> He's after you, backslider. Backslider, come home. Lost person, the Lord wants you. He wants you to just bow to altar and say, Lord, I'm lost. I'm not going to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. Lord, would you save me? Oh, he'll do it. He'll meet you at the altar. He'll meet you at the altar. You call it a platform. You call it a prayer closet. You call it anything you want. But a place where the heart is surrendered to God, that's where he wants to meet you. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray that you'd bless this invitation time. And Lord, I pray that this altar would be a place of invitation. This altar would be a place of welcome. This altar would be a place where hearts are surrendered. Oh God, I pray that those who are backslidden would come back to the Lord, winging their way back home. And Lord, for those who are, those who are lost, Lord, that they'd find acceptance in the beloved right here at this altar. Lord, I pray that you'd save souls and that you'd reclaim backsliders. You'd put families back together again and give parents their authority and their zeal to see their children grow upright. And Lord, I pray that you'd just bless marriages. Lord, have your way. Whatever happens to be on our heart today, something that's come between us and you, Lord, remind us of it. And when we stand in just a moment, Lord, I pray that those who need to speak to you would find their way to the altar and say, yes, Lord, yes. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask you to stand with me.